Tara. Say when. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bar None Cowboy Church. So, is the camera on us? Yes. It looks like it's looking over there. I got you. All right. You want a close up? No, I do not want a close up. Now get one of those guys out there. You want me to swing it? Uh, yeah, well, you could, but Joe would be wanted by the FBI probably or so. Hope your Bible's to second or to First Timothy tonight. So on Sunday nights, I've been teaching you more about what I'm teaching the elder candidates and what they're going through. Our current elders have went through all this, and so our new guys are going through it. And uh, so I want to kind of teach you guys a little bit more. The the candidate guys like it that I'm educating you along with them, so that. You kind of have an understanding and have some compassion that, you know, elders, deacon, uh, ministries are not easy. They're, they come with some stress. Uh, they come with uh, a lot of devotion to upholding oneself right with God. And, and that's not always easy. I don't care what anybody says. I told the guys tonight, there's one thing I really don't like in some people, and that's a self-righteous attitude. I do not like that. I don't think it's right. I don't think we're supposed to project ourselves as so self-righteous. It's kind of like I heard an old boy preaching one time. He said, these people were so so heavenly bound, there were no earthly good. You know? And you all know what I mean. You've seen those people, if it rained, they'd drown. You know? Because so they got their nose way up there. Well, church, to me, should be everyday people who have a relationship with Jesus and each other. We're not perfect people, and that's what I try to tell all people all the time. If the reason church is a screw up is because we're in it. I mean, really, we're just people. We're not perfect people. We have a perfect Redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We have a perfect God, our Father. But we're not perfect. And when we start thinking we are, is when we fail. I think when we live humble before God, and be hospitable towards one another and caring and loving for each other. I think that's where you find peace. Where the church just gets along good with each other. You know, don't put expectations on Mike. Well, I can't even use Mike because I know what Kimberly told me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when we start putting expectations on people, we actually start judging people a little bit. We don't want to do that, you know. Tomorrow night, I got Joe and Marianne on the fire. Be sure and watch that because that's going to be a hoot. And uh, I've already been threatened by Marianne. She's going to sit in the middle, and whichever one gives her a hard time, she's going to punch us. So, I, I'm going to have Rick fill in for me tomorrow night. <laughs> but, but anyway, tonight, in our book for our elders training, we, we're in a chapter... Now don't take offense to this because it's talking about sheep. But it says, smell like sheep. That's what the title is. So it's not saying you smell. But what, it's, what it was teaching, is it okay if I go down there? Okay. What it's teaching the elder candidates is basically about shepherding. And one of the things that brought out really good tonight is something that I, I love and it teaches that a lot of the ways churches have set themselves up is wrong. They have a business model instead of a biblical model. You know the difference? A lot of elders and deacons in churches today set themselves up as a board of trustees instead of men of God. And so this book does a great job, and I was teaching with the candidates tonight that this is the biblical way, but this is what most churches have accepted is a business platform instead of a biblical platform. And so what we're, what we're doing here at Bar None is we're getting away from the business platforms back to the biblical platform. Okay? And so... One of the things it says, the problem arises when these business-like elements become part of a comprehensive business model for the congregation that ignores biblical teaching. It might look something like this. It says, pastor is the president or the CEO. I actually knew pastors that were called the CEOs of their churches. 
And I'm like, what? I mean, because I'm kind of old school. My son watches, I'm kind of old fashioned, mm -hmm. you know? That the staff, that would be like Kimberly Ann and my wife and stuff, or like the mm -hmm. vice presidents. Members of the church, you're now shareholders and loyal customers, and visitors are potential customers. This is an actual platform that some churches have that adopted. That's, that's wrong, isn't it? Yes. And the elders' roles, the elders are the board of trustees. But that's not biblical. And so I told our guys tonight, that this can't be where we end up in this church one day. Because I have a strict policy, and Rick will tell you, I protect this church because I have elders. Now let me tell you what's going, what that means. There are churches today, and so you may be watching me right now, and you may get offended that the pastor runs the church. It's his church. That's not biblical. There are churches that the elders have all the say. That's not biblical. There are churches that deacons have all the say. That's not biblical. And there are churches that the church has all the say. That's not biblical. I told Rick, I said, I never want this church to get to a place that a pastor can come in here and overrule this church. We work as a team, all of us together. The pastor that because I'm an elder of the church. You, you need to remember that. As a pastor, I'm a preaching teaching elder, but I'm also a paid staff elder to where the other elders are not paid. That's that's just biblical setups, okay? But so the pastor and the elders, we work as a unified body. The deacons work with us. But so does the church. We all work together for the common good of God and what He wants for His people. Amen. Amen. So what we do here is what we got to protect is we had a meeting here a while back with Kimberly Ann and she was wanting me to be a signer on something and I said no. I wanted to go to the elders. But everything that's been done, the church needs to know what's going on. Right? That way no one can say that the elders did anything because the Bible says we must be above reproach. So to protect my elders, they have to be transparent to you and to me. To protect me, I have to be transparent to the elders and to you. Amen? We all work together as one body. We just got, the Bible says there's just one body, but there's many members. But we all serve God. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen? Not me, not the elders, not the deacons, not you. But we all have a place to serve. So are you all in agreement with all that? Yes. Yeah. Are you getting people saying amen on there? Or are they saying, this guy's nuts? <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> all right. Now you'll know on Sunday nights, I like to have a lot of fun on Sunday nights. Yeah, yeah. I'm really not standing in front of you. <laughs> so, but, so did you go hide that hard again today? No. Okay. I, 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 all right. I saw him ride this Harley the other day. He had on a do-rag and that big old something on his I just pick on you a little bit. So they have a deal here about elders. So our elders candidates, they learned tonight that they have a bigger role than they understand. Is that an elder is equal to pastor in the calling of Ephesians 4 11. Okay? Now there's one thing that they learned tonight is that when you look at Ephesians 4 11, it says that there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then it says pastor and teacher. There's a conjunction between the pastor and the teacher. Okay, according to the Greek teaching in this, and it goes back to the Latin, that puts the pastor teacher as one office. So there's not five gifts to the church, there's only four. So the elder operates in a pastoral sense. Well, you're like, well, Dusty, I thought you was the pastor of the church. Am I? Some people don't know what, what's my calling. What do you all agree my calling to give this to God? I'm an evangelist. Evangelists pastor churches. They oversee churches. You know, 
one of the things that Cheryl found out when she did an interview on me from one of my pastor colleagues told Cheryl that Dusty has a soul winning ministry. That's his ministry. But he also warned you, didn't he? He's just a man. And why would he say that, Cheryl? And so what I'm teaching our new elder candidates 
is to help me shepherd the flock. And where I want them to be useful at is I need help training these young boys to become men for God. Wouldn't that be awesome? Now, if you say, well, Dusty, gosh, I'd like to get involved in that. Talk to the wrong bush. Get the deal. We can use help. We can use resources. We can use money. We may need some money to do some of that. And if you've got property digging and uh, other people, Rick Bird, uh, you know, you want to sponsor a hunt on your property and where the kids can take that big tent. We can have bedrooms. We can set a wood stove in there. You can get a wood stove for that. If you got one, an old wood stove that can fit in that tent. Wouldn't that be fun? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's so necessary that the world is teaching them anything but yes. how to do that. Yes, thank you very much, dear. I would love that. Our teachers would be girls. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, did you see that? I did that. You did that. We didn't turn them in. We didn't turn them in. I mean, we're a cowboy church, right? We need to be rough and tough, right? No. We need to love God and love our family. But you know what? So I thought for a great test for our candidates just for them to do a ministry. I, and it's the way that you love it. Rick already loved it. He already, already kind of we're talking about this. And uh, I think it's a great idea. What do you think? What do you think it's great? Well, I, I think it's an outstanding idea. I, I'm sure Rick and uh, Dan need some help. You know, clearance of land. Get ready for the kids. <laughs> uh, that ain't something boys can learn to do. That ain't farm work. <laughs> clearing land ain't really farm work. So, so I you want to set up any I want to ask you tonight. Do I have your support to help these guys do that? Thank yes. You. Yeah. So, we went fishing at youth camp, and uh, these boys need some help. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one boy, Jeremiah. He stepped here and he just, he's got it down, man. And then I've got one woman. <laughs> and I'm like, nobody get around here. <laughs> And then I've got one. It's in my leg. There's a hook in my leg. I'm like, everybody get away from him. There was a mess. I got some more gray hair. So, anyway, so this is what I want to talk about. So as I set up this, this adventure for these four candidates, it's, it's part of the pastoral says, what is a pastor anyway? The Greek word proomen which we translate as pastor means shepherd, okay? Paomen can refer to a literal shepherd like the ones out in the field in Luke's Christmas story. Far more often, however, Paomen refers to Jesus, our good shepherd. There is also a relative verb as paomeno, which means to shepherd or to tend the flock. So a pastor is a shepherd. A pastoring means caring for a flock not surprisingly, though, our English word pastor comes from the Latin word pastor, which means shepherd, which is the same word we use for elder. So the first test for our candidates is to help shepherd our boys. Now, the Bible says that the older men are to teach the younger men. So now here I have a, another test. All four of my elder candidates have wives, right? What are you doing? Shaking your head no. Oh. oh. So here's here's a, here's something I want to do for you because I want you ladies to know if they don't have you behind them, they're not going to make it in this ministry. Right, Rick? Your wife works with you in children's ministry and man, it's a that woman is fired up after her wedding night. She is so excited. Lady, my hat's off to you. You're out there on Tuesday night teaching with your husband. Have you all seen that? I have. And he's just a candidate. And, and God's already moving them into that ministry working. Isn't that awesome? You support your husband in ministry after, what, 800 years of my food is little here. So... And so you know what I'm talking about. He's got to have you. You've got to have her, don't you, kid? Yeah. Just like Katrina. Man, I wouldn't be half the man I am today without Katrina. She is a great pastor's wife. 
And so for you to be successful, I know she's a rough one. And, uh, and you, you know, yours just got all the money. <laughs> so what I would like to ask the elder candidate wives is to develop a ministry for the girls. A way to teach these young girls how to be women. As the Bible says, to love their husband. What do you all think, church? You like that? Yeah. Yeah. I saw Cheryl look at Dave and say, you straighten up. <laughs> so, but, I, I, and I think what this is, is, is when the elders and their wives realize that they have a role in this church to shepherd it, our <coughs> current elders, they've been working in this church for years. I mean, I have, I have the greatest respect for Brother Rick and Candy because <coughs> some of you guys don't know, but Rick carried a lot of hats here. And I'm just, I'm not trying to boast him up. He has actually surrendered a lot of those duties now because we got help. And it's help, isn't it, Rick? But Rick carried a lot of hats here to keep this church going because this is a vision that he helped start years ago to start going out of the church. And so we're at a place now to where this church, we got people stepping up and taking places. And my hat's off to all of you guys. If you all are helping make this church what it is today, it's a, it's a great place for people, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a great place to find the love of God and to be a part of it. And so as pastor, I don't want all the responsibilities. I want to equip you to be happy serving God. And so ladies, are you up for the task? Yes, All right. Well, would that be awesome? So now the first place I'll tell you men and women to start is with Katrina because those are her kids. Now she has no idea this is going on. <laughs> I won't break the news. I won't break the news to her. At dinner tonight. Yeah, but uh, I will break the news. And you know what? It's not going to interfere with anything she's doing. And she's going to love it because you don't like ranch camp. I was talking to a parent today with one of our boys today. And uh, I asked them about ranch camp. They said, I would love that because that would be better than him sitting at home on Facebook or playing games all day. So, you all, you guys kind of, you kind of like this stuff we're doing here? It's biblical, isn't it? To work with our young kids. So, now, any other ladies that you may want to assist these ladies? Okay, i got to have a lady to kind of be the ramrod, to answer to me. Which one of you four ladies want to be the ramrod? Look at them all pointing at each other. <laughs> You're going, oh, so you and Ron are going to ramp all of this one. Okay. All right. Well, on the first thing you got to do, the first thing is write me a check. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Hey, I might as well, but don't drop it. It might bounce. But anyway, so this is part of the, I want you all to see tonight. I want to share something because this is how these elders are going to be brought forth to you, the church. And not only are they going to study the Word of God, they're going to do the Word of God. So, I think that's the right way to do it, don't y'all? I want you, the church, to evaluate your ministry for me. Help me out. But here's one thing I want to ask you to please be respectful of. Some of them have full-time jobs. Be, be, be respectful of that. They may they may be exhausted, and, they, and we may have to... You know, we need to be kind of like... What's those two guys on the side of Moses? What was their names? That held up his arms. Because yeah. I've already told you, the current elders I got, let's don't hold their arms down. Sometimes let's pick them up and help them. Yeah. And these new guys, we may step up and help them. Because what's happening is the current elders I have and these new elders are helping hold my arms up. Amen. My deacons help hold my arms up. And believe it or not, several of you in this church do it too. Because you help me a lot too. Amen. And so, that's what I want us to promote is one body in Christ holding up each other to fulfill the calling that we have. Amen. Yes, sir. 
And that's the same word in context to where God took a piece of dirt and formed a man and breathed into his nostrils and he became a living being. That was Adam. So what Jesus did in John 20, 22 is he took back what the devil stole Amen. from Adam. The birthright. You see, Adam was a spirit being. He was a chunk of dirt, but he didn't have any of this fleshly stuff that decays until he sinned. And when they walked out of the Garden of Eden, he became looking like this today. Before then, he looked like God. God is spirit. Jesus, when he resurrected from the dead, had no organs working in his body and had no blood in him. Jesus showed us that life is in the spirit and that spirit originated from God into Adam. And when he sinned because of temptation, he lost that birthright. That's where God said, you will die. And what he meant was that connection of relationship is over and now you're going to decay over time. But that spirit to where you live forever with God is over. And then all of a sudden we got a clock because there was no time until sin. And so as that entered in, man became a dying being instead of a living being. At the moment of birth, we start dying. And every one of us, it says, is appointed unto us to die and then to judgment. But what Jesus showed us is the eternal life that Adam had, we get it back only through receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. By putting our trust in His sacrifice, not in our sacrifices. Understand? So, that at salvation, the Holy Spirit seals you as it says in Ephesians 1.13, it says, In Him you also trusted, after you heard the gospel, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, meaning this Jesus, you were sealed, in whom the Holy Spirit, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, John 14.23, the Holy Spirit of promise, until the day of redemption. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus, and we are sealed in the Holy Spirit after we put our trust in in the finished work of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now we get our birthright back. The Holy Spirit moves in as John 14, 23 says. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will obey me. And he who loves, loves me and my Father will love him and we will come and make our home again. John 14, 23. And so, as we understand that the Holy Spirit is God and the Son come together in oneness in me. That's the promise. Amen. And Jesus said, I'll tear down the temple and it will be rebuilt in three days. When Jesus come out of the tomb, the temple made without human hands was now given life. That's Christ. And now we who received the Holy Spirit are that temple not made with human hands who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and resurrected into new life through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Man, I'm waiting to see someone run around the table. But anyway, Doug, get going. But anyway, <laughs> now, as you know that, there's another Holy Spirit movement. Acts 2. These men are already sealed in the Holy Spirit, and they're all gathering together in one place, and they're all in one accord, and they're praying. That's why it's so important for a church to be in one accord. And that Holy Ghost power poured out as tongues of fire, they said. They saw fire. And that Holy Spirit fire fell upon those men. And the next thing we see is Peter standing up with the eleven in one accord. And Peter preached the first Christian message. Repent, every one of you. And be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For it is promised unto you and to your children and to your grandchildren as far off his generation and what he just preached there was what Jesus promised. If you'll take these steps and do what I've commanded, because Jesus told him, you teach everything I commanded unto you. And that's why he said, be baptized. In, why would you want to be baptized in anything in the name of Jesus? Because it's in the name of Jesus that calls old men to be saved. The, burial, the resurrection, the death, burial, resurrection is portrayed in their baptism. As I go under, I come back up a new creation in Christ. It's, a, it's symbolic of what happened at my salvation. 
Well, that resurrection is through Jesus, not through the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So many, so many people baptize that way. I know some people do. If you're not going to agree with me. But if Peter was not commanded that, why would he teach it? You see, we took we took one of those first of Scripture and we made a whole denomination on it. Go there for them and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But they didn't realize that Jesus taught them three different baptisms. In Ephesians 1, 13 baptism is when I, John 20, 22, they were immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's all the word baptism means. It doesn't mean anything about water. They were immersed and sealed in the Holy Spirit of salvation. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. How come we don't say, I baptize you in the name of the Father Jehovah? He said to do that. So what is the name? Is it Jehovah? Is it Yahweh? He said, baptize in the name of the Father. What's his name? Yeah. Adonai. Oh, Adonai. But how do I get baptized in the name of the Father? I must receive the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. But he said, my Father will love him. And my Father and I, the Father comes first. We'll make our home. There's the immersion of the Holy Spirit that sealed me. Then I get baptized or immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then... He said, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit that so many Baptists today don't talk about. And some Pentecostals talk about way too much. But, what is that? That's Acts 2. And he, he said, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sin, and then you can receive the gift. But you can't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit until you get an obedience with the baptism. Which starts first in the Holy Spirit of salvation, baptism, and then there's something now. I have the ability to be empowered to do ministry. That's what Acts 2 is, right? They all got one accord. What happened? I heard something rushing like a mighty wind. And it wasn't a bunch of Baptists sleeping in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> right? We got it. It was. We every Sunday morning at the altars, don't we? At the altars, you can feel that Holy Spirit power. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You think we wouldn't have them altars? Are you so, in that, in that prayer for the field? Yeah. Yeah. And then what happens? Peter preaches the first message, and 3,000 people are born again. So just think, 3,000 people got baptized that day in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. Because you think about it, even in Acts 19, they rebaptized people who were not baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They rebaptized them because they weren't baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized in something else. I baptized five kids years ago. That's fine. Baptized everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus for the permission to see. My wife said that she could already tell the difference in a couple of them. She said this morning, Riley. Riley's. You just gotta know Riley. He's cool. And she said this morning, Riley got everybody together and prayed. And she said, You should have heard that kid pray. And she says, He's never spoke like that in his life. And she's known him. She's known him for five years. She says, From the night, from the night that he sat there and cried, he cried Friday night and he cried last night. And I didn't preach hard yet. I just talked. He was there. I taught the truth about God's love to them and everything, about they have a purpose. And Riley was tired as much. And then the last night, five kids were instantaneously transformed the Holy Spirit gift. And they prayed to receive it. They wanted that spirit of God. And they were crying and started confessing sins. I mean, little sins like, I've not been good to my parents. I've been mouthing off at my parents. I, I've been lying things that we think, but you know what? It was big to them. Mm -hmm. So that's where they're at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One little girl said, I think I because Drew and uh, and uh, Easton have never been baptized. They got saved a while back. 
And they, I need to be baptized. Well, who would have told them that but God? That's right. And I said, well, you want to do it tonight? I, I, I want to do it. I don't care. I want to, I want to get right with God now. That, that, there's an urgency in them boys. Well, then one of the girls says, I think I need to be baptized too, Pastor. And I said, what? I baptized you were in it. God showed me. And she started, I said, wait a minute. We'll talk to Mr. Trina. Because Mr. Trina is a youth leader and out of respect. I want them to go to her. So when I'm senior pastor of the church, I want those kids to work with their ministry. So then here comes Riley. And I said, yeah, do you want to see Katrina? Yep, yeah, I'm going to go watch Katrina. And next thing I know, God just started pouring out on these kids. And I mean, it was amazing. Ron and Kaniki came in because Ron stayed last night with the kids. And he walks in and it's going on. And it was powerful, wasn't it? Ron said, you, he walked in, he said, you could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit so powerful here last night. Out there, it was amazing. And uh, that's what I'm talking about is that when we get to the Word of God and we teach the Word of God, God moves. And this is what we're talking about is we're raising up these kids to take over. I want to find somebody to take my job one day. I want to find young men to be future elders. And who should treat them? But the elders. To be men of God. To be men who love their wives as Jesus loves the church. Take them camping and have fun with them a little bit. Teach them how to fish. Teach them how to hunt. Teach them some survival skills. I mean, so many kids like to have a lot of fire if they don't have trouble like it. They don't have to turn on their phone. I wish they'd teach me how to do that. Like to do but, <laughs> what? Google will tell them how to start a fire. <laughs> that Google got me lost more and it doesn't mean that I'm using a map. I want my address. I can get anywhere with that. But so, as we look at this right here, we see that we have a responsibility to shepherd. Well, if we're not working with individuals in the church, we're not shepherds. Right? Now, Rick, he teaches two classes plus a youth group or a kids group. Now, he's booked. So I'm not asking him to do anything else. But we're getting more men rising up. All right, Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you. So our candidate elders are going to start with the children, the boys. And you want the wives of the elders are going to start doing something for the girls. And it's just something once a month. You know, Cheryl had a great deal where you and Nell did the sewing thing. And something, did the boys, some of them do that too? Yeah. That's when that one sewed his finger into the garden. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now that's big Joe. So I had to cut Joe's finger off. So, not overseeing out of compulsion, but freedom. What does that mean? Not what we're seeing out of compulsion. Being forced to do it. Forced not feeling like you're forced to do it. But doing it because you want to. Yeah, and you see the need. Okay. okay. So. Or. I have to be paid to do it. I'll tell you right now. I don't do this for money. I started more ministries. And I didn't ask for anything. Now you guys gave me a raise. Thank you. But you know last year I didn't even make a raise. I told them I didn't want it. And so, we started more ministries, and you guys blessed us. My wife and I were raised this year. That's nice. Thank you. But I would have done it without you. Just like this deal for the kids in June, July. In July. I don't, I'm doing it because I love God and I love these kids. And my wife and I want to do more to teach these kids to one day what it is to be servants in this church. And the best way I'm going to do it is let's go to the widows and clean their yards. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Now don't kill your husband so we'll come clean the yard. Okay, don't do that. Nail, tell that. So yeah. <laughs> Never mind. According to God's will, not for the not for the money, but eagerly, not holding it over those entrusted to you. One of the things that elders want has to learn is that you don't lord over people in the church. You are to be like Christ. You are to be a servant to your church. So that's where we're going to train these young men to learn what it is to be servants. These young kids, the girls and the boys with this camp, this ranch camp ministry on, in July. And so, 
and I want these young kids to get to know the elders. I want them to, because our current elders, they're going to get involved in this down the road. This is an assignment for my candidates, but it doesn't mean the current elders won't be involved. This is something you're going to bring, and you're going to bring it to the whole church. Amen? Because the church nominated you guys. My job is to equip you, and it's going to be the church's job to stand back and say, we're in agreement for their ordination. Not just my opinion. I'm going to let you all have a voice in their ordination. Because you're the ones that are going to say, yes, we agree for these men to be these men in this church. Amen? Amen. Correct. Not lording it over those that trust you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, hallelujah, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Isn't that a beautiful thought? I know some of you are hoping it's shaped like a cowboy hat. But Peter's words sound reminiscent of what Jesus said to him after the resurrection. Feed my lambs and shepherd my sheep. And that's what we're talking about tonight. So, I'm going to stop right there. And I want to share a, a passage of Scripture tonight that I shared with the group tonight. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, but I want to let you guys get out of here. As you know, we've had a long week here at Cowboy Church with the kids and stuff. My wife, I gave her the night off, but I promised I'd pick her up a little after seven to take her out to dinner tonight. Because we've been eating uh, church food all week. And it was great. <laughs> In chapter 2 it says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now I'm teaching this to my elders, but this should be your behavior. Okay? For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. We need to remember that God desires all men to be saved. And so as elders of a church, we must have a ministry by bringing salvation to the people. It doesn't mean that you're going to be the preacher or the voice, but you should work involved in ministry that is bringing people to Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, we go a little further here. Uh, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So there, that's a two-part ministry. Helping in evangelism, but also in edification. Got that? To bring the men to the knowledge of the truth is to edify them in the Word of God. Like I'm doing these four men, teaching them the Word of God to edify them in all truth, then they turn around and they're going to start teaching these boys. Isn't that awesome? You're teaching on Tuesday nights. Husband and wife, you're teaching Wednesday Silver Spurs. And it's not rusty spurs. No, it's silver spurs. Okay. Just give you some things. <laughs> so, now we see that for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, Amen. who gave himself, what? A ransom for all. I want you to remember that the Word of God is for all people, it's not just for a select group of us. I don't care if they're in drugs. I don't care if they're a Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. I don't care if they're demon-possessed as the man with the legions of Mark 5. Jesus Christ died for all people. Amen? Amen? I don't care if they're practicing homosexuality. I'll preach the gospel to them. Because I was going to hell just like people who had in that lifestyle. And they're still going to hell. And somebody told me the truth. Amen? We need to have that compassion in our heart for all people. So as we do this, we realize that who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We need to be testified. We need to be telling people what Jesus has done for us. Who's right here? Who, how many of y'all has Jesus done something for you? Boy, I got a list for Monday Night Fire coming up. All right. Because that's what Monday Night Fire is about. So for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, 
I am speaking the truth in Christ, not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Somebody pick up verse 8 and 9 for me. I will therefore that men pray everyone, lifting up the holy hand without wrath and doubt. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and surprise, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly or Okay. Verse 10 says, But which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Anybody want to expand on what this is? Just be modest. Don't be dressed up looking like you should be on the corner downtown somewhere. Right? So, pretty much self-explanatory. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. A lot of the problems that was going on during this time is women didn't know that they had a voice because men held them in a place of law and rules that they could not be free to speak. And when that was taken down through Christ, they got excited and they were asking questions in church service with Eric the teaching. And he just said, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to do this right, he said. So he says right here in verse 12, that I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. That's one of the reasons why a woman can't pastor a church. Anybody disagree? It says it right there. And it's not that women aren't great teachers. I mean, we have a lady that teaches the youth here, amen? Right, and you all witness today, she does a great job. Okay? Candy teaches with Rick, the little kids, the little kids. And she does a great job with Rick. Okay? What it says is, they can't have authority over men in the church. Now let's read why, okay? Now this is what the Word of God says, amen? Alright. For Adam was formed first, did he? And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now I would suggest that you use that to win a fight. <laughs> okay? That's not what that was written for. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith. Childbearing does not save you faith in Christ does, but it's also teaching about one of the greatest purposes for the woman is to bring forth life. Amen. And men can't do that because he knew we'd screw that up. You wouldn't do it again. Sit here and be spat out. Wait a minute. What did it say? Uh, you are to be silent. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Neil. We love you, Neil. Just don't, just don't do that again. <laughs> You're probably right. You're probably right. <laughs> so, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So, I was teaching the guys that tonight is that when you look at this area here, this teaches us a lot about our personal conduct and our wives. And the greatest value for a man of God is to have that woman of God with you. Man, with that woman of God beside you, you've got something that so many people don't have. And that's unity, that Holy Spirit working together in your home, a husband and wife ministry team. I mean, there's a great team in the Bible called the Quill and Priscilla. And, you know, she preached more about Jesus than he did. And, but she didn't have authority. She wasn't a pastor and all that stuff. But she was just a witness testifying of God and Jesus Christ. In fact, they took Apollos and redirected him back to the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he found it in more perfect. Yes, because he was only baptized in John's baptism. And Aquila and Priscilla taught him about the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sin. And they rebaptized him. And then John went out, or Apollos went out teaching more of not just Jesus and John's baptism. He started teaching about the baptism in the name of the Lord, and he expounded the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? He didn't get mad. Well, I thought what well, I was talking. I go find me another group. He didn't do that. He listened. And that's one of the most beautiful things with a husband and wife in ministry together is that it's not one person's ministry, it's God's. 
But God brought us together as a husband and wife to serve Him. So why is it if you're not married, you've got to find your husband? Charlene, we look for John Deere Green, Bubba. And then I'm just teasing. But, you know what? There's nothing better, I'll tell you what, there's nothing better than having a godly wife. Right, guys? One that prays with you. I mean, I love it. I look forward to every morning, me and my wife, we Bible study, we pray together, and we, we have a conversation. You know what I mean? We just have time to have a conversation. And I get to, and what it does, what it's done for me, for Trina and I, it reminds you every day that you've got a person there that's intelligent. You've got a person, a helpmate that God gave you that loves you and looking out for you. You've got someone there that would fight for you. It's like, I want to fight for her. And you realize you've got a partner that you could never find. And when she sees that you love her so much that you can teach the Word of God to her at home, that woman just pours more love back on you. It's beautiful. Now, I love it. I mean, I don't know if you all picked on it today, but I think my wife kissed me five times before the end of church. <laughs> Opening the door for her pays off. Because <laughs> here's what I, here's what, you know, every time I open the door for my wife, she kisses me. I'm like, yeah. Let <laughs> me open that for you again. So ladies, kiss your husband, and he'll open the door for you. If he doesn't want you to kiss, uh, we we'll get some counseling going here. But, you know, because my wife, I this, and I just say this because I get praise to God. Because you all know I went through a divorce years ago. I was married 30 years. And I shared with the, the guys tonight, that was a very dark time for me. And through that, I made some bad choices. I did some things I should do because I was angry. I was mad at God a little bit. I mean, I felt like I lost everything. I lost my kids. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I've been in a dark place to where I came to a point about taking my life. I mean, really. And I, I told Rick this. I was, I've was thought about it. And that's a sign you need help. And guess who pops in my life? I had a person right there that picked up that I was hurt. And she came in there and loved me through that. And I just want you to think about it. I could not be here tonight because of that. Do you realize how important you are? You see what God did this week with those kids, but the devil would have convinced me that I was worthless like some of my pastor friends told me I was. That's what happened. Friends of mine that were pastors told me I was done. You're worthless. You, you, you're divorced. You can't, be, you can't serve God anymore. My fault, her fault, who's their fault, don't matter. We got divorced. I, I didn't do it. She divorced me. I tried not to. <laughs> So, look at all the salvations we've had in this church if I would have listened to the light. When I talked to Rick, one of the first things I said to him, I said, Rick, I want you to know I'm on the board. And he said, so am I. He said, we're not going to worry about asking steps. And I thought, wow. Because most churches today will just turn their nose at you. I told my wife, I said, I think I'm a better pastor now than I was. Because going through that storm in my own life, it helped me open my eyes to that just because someone's in a storm doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. Things could have been pushed on them and what their fault. And instead of look at the storm and how big it is, maybe what we need to do is just come in there and try to help them through it. I needed help. Not one pastor friend of mine would help me. You know who was the only friend? I used to have a lot of friends, I thought. But you know the only friend that stayed connected to me through that was J.D. Baker. My Chuck Ray. My leather craft. He's the only one, and he had some people say some things about me, and he said, stop. I know. Just because of what's going on, it doesn't change who he is. He was, out of all those friends, that's the only one that stood by me. Until I, I got all you guys. Amen. 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 Amen.
put me in my grave. What'd you say? I said put the family in grave. Oh, family grave. I thought you said put me in the family grave. <laughs> you gonna be on the fire tomorrow night? Oh, it's written. I need you to fill in. So, any questions? I need to let you go. <laughs> so, y'all like this kind of stuff? Yes. Amen. So, God is good. Thank you, ladies, for volunteering tonight. And, uh, wasn't that good? We are not sitting in the morning. We are in trouble already. So, somebody asked me, are you going to be doing dinner tonight? And I promised my wife, I'm just going to figure out the state card. Uh, we don't have to have reservations. We can ask to give reservations. We don't have to now. So I asked that early this year, I just going to go up and just relax. That's up to me. So if you want to go, you're welcome to go. We're just going to go up there right after this and I got to go pick you up. Any thoughts about tonight? Anything? Amen. Amen? Yeah. All right. I appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for sponsoring the kids this week. I love this church that we didn't try to raise money. And, uh, you know, uh, our finances are doing pretty good. We pray for our finances. Uh, we do have another camp coming in at the end of the month. Now it's a pain camp. But these are kids, only two of the kids coming are coming to our church. The rest of them are kids from all over the country areas coming at part of this. Our parents are going to be staying here with us that week. They're going to be in the horse trailers out here camping now. Those RV sites, this is, I'll tell you what, you talk about we doing what God said. Every, almost every one of those RV sites are taking up with families. And when they found out that we thought they could stay here for free, well, they paid 300 bucks a kid to come. But when they found out we had camping sites and we invited them to come and stay, even for the parents to bring their horse, so when they had free time, they could ride with their kids out here and enjoy the beautiful place that God gave us out here. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. The parents are like, really? We can come with the kid. We, we've never been a camp. We can stay. We want you to stay. You know why? Because I'm not just after their kids. I'm after the dads and the moms. Amen. 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 So, anyway, Brother Rick, I always like to let you close it out. Anything you want to share about this week or anything? Go for it. It's a great week. I mean, obviously, my great friend Raleigh. It's awesome to see that kind of stuff go on. You know, and you guys, parents and churches, where we just come to you and I'm just so thankful for all you do for us. Just thankful for the blessings of the people that we came for, and just the hearts that were touched and changed, Lord. Thank you so much for just providing the words for Katrina and Dustin and just all those that were up here, Lord. It's awesome to be able to see your love just step in here, Lord. I thank you for that. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. You know, it's so present and obvious here, Lord. People know that when they walk in here, that this is the place of the Lord. That way, I'll pray for our Bible studies this week, Lord. Pray for Monday Night Fire. Pray for Mary Ann and Joe. And really pray for Pastor Destiny. <laughs> pray for all of them, Lord. I'm just uh, I'm excited because I know what the Lord's done for them. We just pray for our Monday Night Bible study and all our Bible studies this week. Just pray for those that are on our prayer list. We've got some members and, and folks that aren't in good health, Lord. We, we've got lots of people that we're praying for to come to you. Because it is your will that all men come to you, Lord. We're not going to forget that. We're going to continue to spread your word and plant those seeds. The Bible says that the word is your the seeds are your word. That's Lord, right. Your seed. Yes. We're thankful for that. Be with us throughout this week. Jesus Christ, we're going to pray. Amen. Amen. Give somebody a big hug. Tell them you love them tonight. God bless. Woo